Okay, so last time we looked at uh, torque, which basically uh, is provided whenever a force tries to uh, rotate, uh, works to rotate a body. Um, we're going to keep looking at torque today, but now we're going to look at the situation. What happens when um, a force is acting on a body and it's not perpendicular to that um, object? So take, for example, this, uh, this here. We've got a, a beam, again, attached to the wall by a hinge and then attached to the roof by a rope. And we're hanging a sign from the end of the beam. Well, if we were to diagram all the forces acting on this system, we'd see that there's a force of gravity pulling downwards here, and there'd be a tension in the rope. Now, of course, this rope is, is sort of on an angle here, and so the tension would act along the rope, something like this. Um, uh, in addition, the beam itself has a weight, and so we'd have another force, maybe we'll call this FG1, and then here in the center of the beam, I'd have another force, FG2. And so, um, as we saw last day, this isn't the full story because um, presumably there could be forces acting here on my uh, pivot. Um, now, I'm not totally certain uh, at this point, but I have a, a, an idea that the, the Y force might be upwards, and we're going to verify that a little bit later. Um, and then, if I look at the X, X force, uh, I note that this tension is pulling the, is pulling the um, beam off the wall, and so there would be an X component of this force over to the left. So first thing I want to do is I'm just going to um, kind of compare this. I'm going to redraw this, this system, and I'm going to um, break all of my forces into their components when I do. And so I've got a tension pulling along this way. Uh, I've got a force of gravity at the end of the beam here, Fg1, a force of gravity in the center of the beam, Fg2. Um, and then, of course, as I said, I've got my uh, Y force up, my supporting force on the hinge, up and to the left. Now, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this tension force into components. And I'm going to break into components and I'm going to say, well, how much of the tension force acts directly um, upwards in this case and how much acts directly to the right? Now, you might be looking at that thinking that we're splitting this into X and Y components. But in actual fact, what we're doing is we're splitting it into components of tension that are perpendicular to the beam and parallel. So I'm actually going to call this T perpendicular instead of T, uh, y, and I'm going to call this T um, parallel. So this component of the force pulls perpendicular to the beam, and this component pulls parallel to it. What you notice if we break the tension in, uh, into component forces, um, the parallel component does not contribute to the torque in either the clockwise or counterclockwise direction. If you just come along to this beam here and just pull directly to the right, that would have no net torquing effect around this pivot here at the end. And so the only component that matters in my torque equation is going to be the perpendicular component. So whenever we have, whenever we're calculating the net torque on a body, we must always use the perpendicular component of the force. And as I said, in this case, it kind of looks like it's the same as X and Y, but we'll see examples later on where it's a little bit different. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's solve this, um, this example. So the first question, um, the first thing they're asking for us to find is what is the tension in the rope? What is the total tension in the rope? And the next thing is what are the vertical and horizontal components of the supporting forces, Fx and Fy? Okay, so I know that since it's in rotational equilibrium, Tc tau c is equal to tau cc. And um, if again, I've chosen my pivot here as being this uh, leftmost hinge. Um, my distances, um, are, are, is 2.2 meters across the entire system. So maybe I'll think of this as D1 being 2.2 meters, whereas this occurs at D2, which would be halfway, so 1.1 meters. Okay, so torquing this body clockwise is going to be both FG1 and FG2. And so I would get FG1 times D1 plus FG2 times D2 is equal to not the total tension, but just the perpendicular component of tension, also times D1. Solving for T perpendicular, I get FG1 D1 plus FG2 D2, all divided by D1, and I can substitute my values. So the beam itself has a, has a weight of 100, or sorry, 50 newtons, and the weight at the end is 100 newtons. Newtons times 1.1, all divided by 2.2. Now, um, going through and solving here, I see that T perpendicular 
is going to be equal to 125 newtons. And while that's great, uh, the actual question is asking me for not just t perpendicular, but what is um, t total. So going back, I notice here that um, this rope makes an angle of 30 degrees with the beam. And so this angle here would be 60 degrees. And so I could say that um, the cosine of 60 degrees is equal t perpendicular over t, or solving for t, t equals uh, t perpendicular divided by cosine of 60 degrees, which is 125 divided by cos 60, which just gives me a total of 250 newtons. And that's my total tension in the line. Now, um, I need to find these two uh, components here. So I need to find what is the y component and what is the x component of these, um, uh, these supporting forces. Well, <clears throat> this is where I'm going to just hop back to my, um, my translational equilibrium equations, which says the sum of all the x forces have to add up to zero. <clears throat> we can note that part of this tension pulls to the right, and then the force must pull back to the left. So t parallel minus fx equals zero, or put another way, um, fx must just be equal to t parallel. And t parallel, as we can see from this diagram, is just going to equal um, t tension total times the sine of 60 degrees, which works out to be approximately 217 newtons. I can do a similar uh, thing for my y components. The sum of all the y components must add up to zero. And so upwards, I've got t perpendicular plus Fy, and downwards I've got my two forces of gravity. So T perpendicular plus Fy minus Fg1 minus Fg2 has to balance out to zero. And so Fy uh, must be the difference between my weights, Fg1 plus Fg2 minus T perpendicular. And this works out to be right around 25 newtons. All right, so not too bad. Let's take a look at um, a couple more examples here. Um, the rule that you always want to keep in mind when you're solving these torque problems where the forces aren't acting necessarily at right angles is that um, the torque acting on a body must always, uh, you must always use the component of force that is perpendicular to the beam or whatever it is that's rotating. So let's take a look at this one here. I've got a 1.8 meter long beam, um, uh, sorry, uh, 12 kilogram bar attached to a wall by a hinge and then supported by a rope as shown. Um, find the tension in the rope. And you can see that the, the beam makes an angle of 32 degrees to the horizontal. Well, the first thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna diagram all of my forces. So I've got a weight here, Fg, which is pulling down. And then I've got a tension up here in my rope. Now again, you could reason out there, there will be some supporting forces here on the beam. There wouldn't be anything to the left and right because these other forces, the only other forces in the system are, are just vertical. But you could tell that actually this force of gravity must be larger than tension because it's so much closer to that pivot. And so the pivot itself must be providing a supporting force upwards. And so we'll include that. Now I'm gonna choose my pivot point and this is gonna be my pivot right here. Um, uh, since this is my hinge, and then I'm just gonna kind of map out my distances. So I'll call the distance between Fg at the center of the beam and the, and the um, pivot to be D1, and that will be 0 0.9 meters. And then this entire distance here, I'll just call this D2. Now before I go forward here, <clears throat> I need to recognize that these forces, um, while they are vertical, they are not perpendicular to the beam. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break these two forces down into components um, that go parallel and perpendicular to the beam. I'm gonna start with the perpendicular component. So I'm gonna ask myself, how much of this force goes in such a way that it'll be directly perpendicular to the beam? And then I can turn and complete my, um, my vector uh, diagram here with a component that is entirely parallel. So this would be Fg perpendicular and this would be Fg parallel. I can do something similar with my tension. Uh, where I can uh, resolve it into perpendicular and parallel components. A certain amount of this tension is directly perpendicular to the beam, and then the rest of it is parallel. And that sometimes takes a little bit of practice, being able to draw those um, components. I find it really helpful to start with the perpendicular component first, and then draw the parallel component second.
Now, so a quick look um, uh, using some geometry here. I need to figure out what the angles are inside those triangles. So I, I know here there's a little right angle triangle right here that makes a right angle. Uh, this is 32 degrees, so that means this is complementary to that, which is 58 degrees. But then this whole thing makes another 90 degree angle, so this angle here must be 32 degrees. Uh, similarly, I can prove that this angle here must be 32 degrees. And so uh, I'm going to need those for my my calculations. Um, torque clockwise equals torque counterclockwise. And so torquing this clockwise, I see that that is Fg perpendicular times d1. And torquing counterclockwise is T perpendicular times d2. Well, Fg perpendicular, when I look at this diagram uh, as, a, as a component of, of Fg, is really just going to be Fg times the cosine of 32 degrees which is just mg times the cosine of 32 degrees. And similarly here, t perpendicular, I can see that that's going to equal t times the cosine of 32 degrees. So substituting these into my equation, I get mg cos 32d1 is equal to t cos 32d2. Now something interesting happens here, and this isn't going to happen all the time, but in this case it does where I've got a factor of cos 32 on both sides of my equation, so I can cancel them out. That makes life a little bit simpler. Solving now for tension, I get te tension equals mg d1 over d2. And when I plug in my values here, 12 times 9.8 times d1, which is 0 0.9, all divided by 1.8, my total tension I see is 59 newtons. All right, we're going to take a look at one last example here. It says, <clears throat> find the mass of the object given the information uh, given the information in the diagram and the fact that the weight of the uniform beam is 115 newtons. Okay, so first step, as always, let's draw some forces. So I've got a force of gravity here. I'm going to put Fg1. And then I've got a force of gravity here. Maybe I'll call it Fg2. I've got a tension in my line, which is in this direction. And the tension is 675 newtons. I see this beam as it hangs makes an angle of 50 degrees to the wall. Um, I need to include, I need to decide where my pivot's going to be. So I'll use this, this hinge again as my pivot. Now, before I break this into components, I find it actually easier to think about my X and Y components on my hinge here before I break this into components. It's just a little bit cleaner. When I first look at this picture here, I can see I've got two forces pulling down, my two weights pulling down, and the tension on the rope is pulling uh, to the right. So since there's only one force in the, in the X direction, and that's pulling to the right, then this wall must be pushing out this way um, uh, in the X direction. Note I haven't drawn these arrows at all to scale, but these two should be the same. Uh, and, and similarly, the, this tension provides no Y component, no Y supporting force. And so those weights that pull down must be supported by a, a Y force, which is upwards um, on that hinge. Again, not drawn to scale. So I'm going to um, figure out all my distances here. And you can see that we haven't been told how long the beam is. We have no idea. But we could just sort of presume that the distance, the length of the beam, let's just call it D for now. And if the length of the entire beam is D, and the rope and the mass are both attached to one end of the beam, then I guess the center of mass of the beam would occur at one half D. All right, um, just before I get started here, now I need to break everything down to components. And this is gonna be a little bit tricky, but maybe this is an opportunity to practice resolving into components. So again, I'm gonna start with FG1 here first, and uh, I'm gonna just break this down into components in such a way that I can, uh, See, how far can I go perpendicular to the beam so that all I need to do is turn and go completely parallel to the beam and I will end up with my total overall Fg vector. Um, I can do the same thing here with Fg1 and you should start to notice that these two are similar triangles. They, they share an angle um, and they look very similar although they might not be the same size. With tension, it's a little bit different. I'm going to um, go in the opposite direction here. I'm going to say, okay, how far do I have to go uh, perpendicular to the beam so that when I turn, I can go parallel to the beam 
and my total tension is resolved. Again, these are all little right angle triangles. It's going to take a little bit of geometry just to uh, figure out where my angles are, but take your time and do this carefully because if you mix up any of these angles, well, then you're not going to be able to, uh, you're not going to be able to get the right answer. Um, notice here that this is, I've got a triangle here formed by the beam and the rope and the wall. This is a 50 degree angle and this is a 90 degree angle, which means this angle right here must be 40 degrees. Since this angle is 40 degrees and this is a 90 degree angle, this angle inside my tension triangle must also be 50 degrees. Um, I can do a little more work here and say, well, if this angle is 40 degrees and here's another 90 degree angle, so this smaller angle here must be 50 degrees. And lo and behold, this is another 90 degree angle, which means this angle here must be 40 degrees. And since these two triangles are similar, this must be 40 degrees. It's really important that you take the time to figure out um, that you organize your angles and everything before you um, get to solving or it's just gonna be a mess. So torque clockwise is gonna equal torque counterclockwise. And <clears throat> if this is my pivot here, my hinge is my pivot, then what's torquing clockwise is actually this T perpendicular force. So I've got T perpendicular and T parallel. In this diagram, I've got FG perpendicular and FG parallel. I guess I should call this FG1. And then this is FG perpendicular two and FG um, parallel two, which is a lot of subscripts. So here I've got T perpendicular times D is equal to FG1 perpendicular times D plus FG2 perpendicular times only one half of D. Now originally I didn't know what my distances were, but it doesn't really matter because you can see that in each of these cases I've got a factor of D and so they're going to cancel out of my overall equation. T perpendicular, if we're careful here with our, our math, T perpendicular can be expressed as T times the cosine of 50 degrees. <clears throat> FG1 perpendicular is equal to FG1 times the cosine of 40 degrees. And then don't forget I've got my little one half, FG2 times the cosine of 40 degrees. So solving for FG1, I get T times the cosine of 50 degrees minus one half FG2 times the cosine of 40 degrees all divided by the cosine of 40 degrees. So substituting my values here, I get FG is equal to 675 times the cosine of 50 degrees minus one half times 115 times the cosine of 40 degrees all divided by the cosine of 40 degrees. Isn't that lovely? Uh, and this all works out to be around 508 Newtons. Now uh, we're nearly done. Note that it did ask us for the mass, not the weight. And so FG is equal to MG or M is just equal to FG divided by G, which gives us right around 52 kilograms. All right, that's it for torque.